Okay. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for Northern Now, the digital event series presented by NME Alumni Relations for our alumni and friends. We're really glad that you could join us tonight. My name is Kylie Bunting. I'm the Director of Alumni and Foundation Communications here at NMU, and I um, really appreciate you joining us for this holiday cooking segment tonight. We're excited to, to, to continue the series and kick off the holiday season with some nostalgic appetizers recipes, but first, a couple of logistics. Um, so we're unable to see and hear you in this webinar format, but we certainly want to hear from you. So. So we'll be monitoring the Q&A section. So if you have any questions or comments for our chefs, please put them there. You can use the chat function at the bottom of your screen to chat with fellow Wildcats tuning in. Just a note that um, the chat window, there's a drop down menu to send chats to hosts and panelists or to everyone. Um, it's defaulted to hosts and panelists. So change that to everybody so you can make sure that you are chatting with your fellow Wildcats. Our next digital event, Northern Now, will be Talks with Tessman, a conversation with President Tessman on January 17th. You can register to join us now and also submit your questions for President Tessman ahead of time. We also have several NMU alumni days on the calendar coming up um, in 2024, including at the Detroit Lions, the Green Bay Gamblers, the West Michigan Whitecaps, the Wisconsin Timber, Timber Rattlers, and the spring training with the Milwaukee Brewers. Um, and then also save the date, homecoming, September 20th through the 21st, 2024. It's also our 125th um, anniversary celebration, so we'll be having a lot of things going on. So mark your calendars for that weekend. Um, plan to be back in Marquette if you can, and we're looking forward to celebrating with you all. You can find more information on our website about this. I also want to take a quick moment just to mentioned Wildcats Connect, which is a platform for, for alumni and students to ask and offer advice. So it's a really great way for you to help out our enemy students, stay connected to the university, and then get in touch with your fellow alumni. Again, more website or more information on our website, and you can also keep, um, keep in touch with us on social media. So now I am thrilled to introduce tonight's chef. Um, and have them show you some great recipes to bring to any holiday gathering. So first, I'd like to welcome Chef Alden McDonald, a 2010 NMU graduate and instructor in NMU's Hospitality Leadership Program. Hi, Chef. And Hello. joining joining Chef Alden is Faith Rausch, a first semester student in NMU's Hospitality Management Program. Welcome, both of you. Thank you for joining us. If you want to kick it off by maybe sharing a little bit about your background and then talk about the space you're in and then dive into the recipes. Right. Thank you so much, Kylie. We're so happy to be here. Uh, it's a lot of fun doing these uh, every so often during the year. Um, tonight, we're going to share a couple of recipes that are near and dear to our own hearts. I, lo I love nostalgic recipes because they are surrounded with, in stories about love and family and cool memories. And then we have Faith with us today. Faith, this is her first semester here at Northern, as does a phenomenal job with us in our program. And she's going to share a little bit about her recipe too, which is really exciting. I'm going to put Faith on the spot a little bit here. Mm -hmm. And I, I warned her ahead of time. But um, Faith, can you tell us just a couple things about the semester that maybe has taken you by surprise or you've really loved or that kind of thing? Okay, well, first of all, thank you guys for tuning in with us. And those are some good questions. I would have to say my favorite thing about the entire program is the community. Our culture is amazing with my classmates, with our professors, and just everyone involved with the program is super supportive and helpful. And the main goal is help the students. So that's fantastic, especially coming from a smaller town from a different um, state. Yeah, where are you from? I am from Woodstock, Illinois, so the northwest suburbs of Chicago. So it's a little bit of a hike, but I love it up here. That's amazing. And I know, um, I'm sure you've heard stories all about our snow and our weather up here, but we yes. haven't had any yet. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I always tell the students, wait until next semester. That's when we get our real weather is in January, February, and March, and sometimes <laughs> all the way into really early May if we're really lucky. So uh, a little bit about our kitchen here. This is our teaching kitchen. Um, our classroom sizes for our lab classes are usually up to about 16 students. We currently have 15 in our Pro Cook One class, which is our introductory fundamentals class. 
And then they go on from there into ProCook 2. They take fire and death management, all kinds of really amazing leadership and management courses as they go through the program. We have two programs. We have an associate's program that ladders perfectly into a bachelor's program as well. And so, yeah, this is our teaching kitchen. And we just, I love cooking from here and showing you things. And it's really exciting to take like these 28 years of industry experience that I have this semester and teach and tell a million stories. I tell a lot of stories. <laughs> she does, but they're good. They're good. Stories, lots of stories. Um, okay. So we're going to start off this evening by making uh, something called Gwenny Sue's. They're known by many other names. We call them in our family Gwenny Sue's because my aunt Gwen is the one who makes these and does a phenomenal job. In fact, when I was preparing for this and thinking about it, I actually texted my aunt and said, Hey, what is your recipe exactly of these Gwenny Sue's? And she shared it with me, which was wonderful. And then what I did, of course, as a chef is I then changed it because that's how chefs work. And tonight we're going to talk two different types of Gwenny Sue's. There's the Gwenny Sue, which has the ground beef and a sage sausage with the cheese and you put it on the bread. But then to make a more inclusive table, I'm actually going to demo the vegetarian version of this, which makes a pretty simple swap out in a couple of ingredients, making this vegetarian and more accessible for more of your audience or your family members uh, coming to your gatherings. So what I've done is, you know, uh, institute a little magic of TV here. And I've already browned off some of my, um, my ground beef, my ground beef and my sausage, but I wanted to show you first and talk a little bit about plant-based products and the differences a little bit and what you're looking for. If you're unfamiliar, there's a few products out there that do a really great job. This is called beyond beef and it, it sautés up like a ground beef. The only thing I would say is it's a little lower in fat. So just be aware of that. Make sure you're paying attention to your pan there. It's, it burns a little easier than a ground beef. And then this here is called, impo oh, there we go, impossible sausage. And I really like the spicy kind. This is really good. The only thing you have to look out for is this is only 14 ounces instead of a full pound, but I just did one to one and it works really good. It's delicious. But I just swapped these two things out for the meat products. And these are both completely plant-based. So for your vegans as well, they're safe to... Uh, serve for your vegan friends and family. And I just swapped these out and I browned them. And I'm going to turn on my heat here and do some actual cooking. Yoo-hoo. And I've already browned it off and mixed it together. I have a 50-50 match. The recipe calls for, the recipe is really easy to memorize because it's one, one, and one. One pound of ground beef or your ground beef substitute, one pound of your sage sausage or your your breakfast, impossible breakfast sausage. Um, I like, like I said, I like the spicy. This is 14 ounces, which is two ounces shy of a pound, but still works. And then one pound of Velveeta cheese. Not a huge fan of manufactured cheeses like that, but for this, it is the perfect ingredient. So what I've done is I browned off both the beef and the sausage in my pan. I'm getting that hot. And then I just have my Velveeta. There it is. Ch uh, cut into big chunks to make it easier so it melts faster. I put this right in the pan. And then there's a few other things that I like to add. A little onion powder or granulated onion. You can do fresh on, um, onion. If you do that, you're going to want to mince that up really, really fine. And then saute that with your protein. Um, then I've got a little sage. This sage was actually grown right out back behind our building. Uh, we have a little herb garden that we do with uh, dining services. Put, and we they very graciously let us use that. I'm going to put a little sage in there too. Some flavoring because I don't have sage sausage for the impossible and a little, a uh, little garlic. Again, if you want to use fresh garlic, you can just make sure you're sauteing that towards the end with your protein. Then we just melt this cheese. Pretty simple stuff. And then I am going to let this work and melt. Now, if you like other flavors, it's perfectly fine. If you also really like spicy, spicy, you could add a little cayenne kick or some red pepper flakes to make it a little spicier. It's whatever your tastes are, your proclivities for your taste. I like to make it not super spicy because I want to make sure it's super inclusive. Whenever I'm doing something like that and there's many, many palettes, I'm always very careful that the flavors will be something that lots and lots of people at the table can enjoy. 
There we go. Okay. So once this melts, there we go. And it melts really fast because it's Velveeta. Thank you, Velveeta, for melting so fast. It's going to come together in like kind of a glob, and it's supposed to. And all we're going for is melting. Now, a couple little tricks and tips on this one is that um, you can do this ahead of time. You can even top your, your bread ahead of time if you wanted to. Pop them in the refrigerator. And then that way, when it comes time for your party, then you can just pop them in the oven. That's really nice because that's that fast, by the way. Look at that. Um, once you pop them in the oven, then they toast off. The filling reheats, that kind of thing. Or, beautiful. And there we have it. it just comes right together. We're going to move these things over. And magic of TV. I have a sheet tray here. And on the sheet tray, I've got some of this. It's called cocktail bread. It comes in rye and pumpernickel. I really like the pumpernickel and the rye. I found this locally at Gordon Foods. Just FYI, if you're looking for it. I looked a couple other places, didn't find it. And I looked it up online and Gordon had it. Thanks, Gordon. Okay. Uh, so when you do these and you pop them in the oven, you're going to take your spoon and just put about a couple tablespoons on there. Uh, some people call this SOS. I'll let your imagination take away as what that means. But um, I vastly prefer the Gwenny Sue's title. And now all this can be done ahead of time, which is really nice for your holiday parties and get togethers because anyone who's hosted a huge event or a get together knows that you don't want to be stuck in the kitchen the whole time cooking because it kind of takes the fun away. Last, uh, last Christmas, I did Christmas dinner at my house. We did Christmas morning at my parents' house and I did Christmas dinner at my house and we did American, like Americanized Chinese food. And it was really fun, but I was definitely in the kitchen the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> because I was busy making sweet and sour chicken and <laughs> tempura vegetables and all this really yummy stuff and uh, wontons and they were delicious but it also took all my time so when we're doing get togethers now I'm a lot more careful about my menu choices to make sure that I can spend some time at the table or in the dining area with my family and friends and not just hiding in the kitchen over a stove so I just, this is a half batch here. The recipe that I, we've shared is for 48 of these. And trust me, they'll get eaten. We go like this, top them. And then we're just gonna pop these in the oven. I'm gonna move these over. We're gonna pop these in the oven for about 10 to 15 minutes until their bread is toasted and the cheese is all kind of melty. And while that's working, uh, we're going to start talking about the cranberry sauce. So I'll this off. Faith is going to help me here reset real quick. Do we have any questions so far? No questions from the audience yet, but while you're uh, rearranging, do you want to talk a little bit about the restaurant there? Yes. So part of the program, uh, we actually have uh, this teaching kitchen here. And then on the other side that you can't obviously, it's off camera, but we have a beautiful restaurant that seats about 40 people. And in that restaurant um, last semester, uh, a class actually was able to do a series of dinners, like Wednesday night dinners that were a pre, like a reservation only, wildly successful. They sold out all the reservation, all the tickets within seven days of opening <laughs> of, of every single night which is pretty impressive, uh, wildly successful, loved it. Uh, the ambiance in there is beautiful. And then we just picked the name. It's going to be called the North Fork, which is really very indicative of the UP, which is really cool. And so have a, keep your eyes out for marketing and, and uh, other types of things that are gonna be happening out of the North Fork. Uh, next semester, also keep an eye out. I don't wanna say too much, but we definitely have some events on the horizon for next semester where people, the public will be able to come in and experience a dining experience in the restaurant and other experiences that are associated with the program that the students will be working on themselves, which is really exciting. As an instructor and a chef, it's so much fun 
to see the students grow and learn and they get to take that creativity and turn it into something tangible. And I can tell you that Faith's class is ready to serve the public. They're so ready. <laughs> like they're chomping at the bit. They're so excited. So we are going to switch gears a little bit while the Gwenny Sue's are in the oven and we're going to start talking about cranberry sauce. So I've never been a huge fan of cranberry sauce. It's just, it's just all right. I know I'm gonna get a little hate for that and that's okay. Um, so what I did is I just developed my own recipe and I actually served this at Thanksgiving this last year. And my aunt Gwen for whom Gwen and Sue's are named, uh, was like, Oh my gosh, this cranberry sauce smells so good. She's like, I don't even like cranberry sauce. This smells so good. And I said, thank you. So I'm going to share with you my cran, my personal cranberry sauce recipe. It is pretty simple. It cooks up in about 15 to 20 minutes from start to finish really quickly. And it's a little different than your normal, just candy kind of tasting cranberry sauce. And it's very versatile. It's really good with pork, turkey, chicken. It's great on a sandwich. It was after Thanksgiving, like a spicy Dijon mustard with this cranberry sauce and a little mayonnaise on a turkey sandwich was so good. And then uh, Faith is going to use it for her appetizer, which is really cool. So it's another different way that you can use cranberry sauce. I know a lot of times people think about cranberry sauce. There's thinking about Thanksgiving, but I think it's a great addition to many, many tables and many, many get togethers. I like to, I like to cook these holiday type dishes all the time. If I can, like not just during the holiday season and the cranberry sauce is something that stays in your refrigerator for a long time too. So once it's cooked and that's nice too. So what I have in my pan is a couple tablespoons of butter. And the reason I use butter and I don't use oil is because the butter will solidify and mix and stay mixed in with the cranberry sauce better than an oil will uh, because it, it solidifies when it gets cold. If you would like to keep this vegan, which you totally can, if you were to omit the butter, you could use a coconut oil. It's kind of sweet, but it will lend itself really well to this. So once my butter has melted, which it has, turn that down a little bit. I've got one onion that I've just diced up. I'm going to put in there and cook one onion. And then one thing I'm going to do right now that I always do with my dishes like this is I add some salt. And the reason I like to add salt at this stage is that salt will actually help draw the moisture out of the onions. And so that you get a little bit better of a saute. Now I don't really want to brown these onions as much as say, if I wanted to brown them for like a hash or, or like for sandwiches or something like that. I just really want to kind of sweat these. So they don't need to be super high heat. And really all I'm looking for the onions is just to soften them slightly because they're going to cook some more with the cranberries and everything else in there. All right. And while that's sauteing for a few minutes, I will talk about the rest of the things that I have on the table here. So I have fresh cranberries. Uh, you can use frozen as well. That's perfectly acceptable. I have a grapefruit that I've just cut in half to make for ease of TV viewing that I'm going to juice. I have balsamic vinegar, which is sort of like my little secret ingredient to this. I have minced ginger and garlic. And one thing I want to show you if they can get in on that, I don't know if you can get on that or not. Thank you. Is that I like my onions and garlic chunky. Notice it's not like a really fine mince. And the reason why is I like to see the texture in my food, especially something like this. This cranberry sauce, you get, you can see the cranberries, you can see the onions, you can see the chunks of garlic and ginger. And I just think it adds a really nice visual appeal to a dish is when you've got that texture in your food. Also, I personally love it when I am eating something and I like bite in and I get that little pop of ginger or that little pop of garlic. And you're like, Ooh, yummy. Look at that. Um, okay. So my onions have almost softened. This is pretty quick, this part. So I'm going to add my garlic. And these actually came out of the freezer. A little, little, a word of the wise. If you have a bunch of garlic, peel it, just pop it in your freezer. And you can always chop it up later. It'll be perfectly fine. Okay. So I'm going to add that. What kind of onion did you use? A red onion uh, or? This is a yellow onion. A yellow or a sweet onion are best for these types of applications. 
And the reason that they're best for this type of application is because you're making something that's sweet. So it's good to have that. I'm a big fan of your, your yellow and your sweet onions. Okay, so all I wanna do is saute that a little bit to get softened, it's soft now. And now I'm going to add my cranberries straight to it and stir it up. Well, we had a few, we'll get those in a second. And what's kind of fun is you can hear them start to pop, the cranberries, which is fun while you're making this. Okay, thank you. And then I'm gonna add my sugar. This Okay, so the recipe calls for maple sugar, which is best. I'm using turbinado sugar because they were out of maple sugar when I went looking for it. But the turbinado sugar will still you, give you that warmth that you're looking for. You, um, I like an unprocessed sugar, like a turbinado, a maple, um, or even like a, um, like a light brown sugar would work well in this because I find that the flavor has a nice, has a, kind of a warmer flavor. I find that white sugar oftentimes it's just like, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like sharp. I don't want a sharp sweet. I want a soft, warm sweet. And so this is that. Grapefruit, I use grapefruit, not orange. A lot of people use orange. The reason I like grapefruit is it's a little more tart, has a little less of that sugar sweetness. And that's what I want. And I'm gonna juice this, but honestly, the biggest reason I juice it this way is just so I make sure I don't get any seeds in here. But then I always check for seeds and I throw the pulp in anyway. <laughs> I'm just gonna throw that right in there. I got one little seed, bye-bye. And then I like the pulp in there, the, pu the pulp is nice. So I throw that in there too. We're gonna do the other one. And we're almost done. I mean, it's that fast. And we just let it cook for a few minutes while it breaks down. And then we have this lovely cranberry sauce that people will go, oh, it smells so good. Because it does, it smells really good. Faith was walking in while I was cooking it. She was like, what is that? It smells so good in here. Like, yes, it does. Thank you, cranberry sauce. There we go. Okay. So I'm gonna throw that juice in there. And I like the grapefruit too, because it gives you more juice. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can get get a shot of this for you so you can see what it looks like before it cooks down there's that so as if you can see that there's lots of the big chunks in there but in then about five ten minutes this is going to cook down you want to cook this over low heat just to simmer until your cranberries get really really soft and it'll thicken up and then depending on how thick you want it i like mine pretty thick you'll see it in a second here so what i do is i take a spoon when I think it's done and I dip it in, and when I dip that in and comes out, if that spoon is coated really well, I know that my cranberry sauce will be thick enough when it cools. And so that is how I can tell it's done. So this is gonna work a little bit here. And while this is working, we're gonna pull the magic of TV and show you here what it looks like when it's done over here. Great, and that is what it looks like when it's done. As you can see, it's like nice, dark, rich color. And the vinegar I add at the very end, right before it's done, right before it's done cooking. I like that tart vinegar flavor in there and it makes all the flavors pop. So that's our cranberry sauce. And then while let's, I'm gonna let Faith show uh, you her cool uh, appetizer and then we'll come back and take a look at Gwenny Sue's and then we're gonna talk about grog. <laughs> take it away faith all right well thank you very much and thank you guys again for having us what i'm going to show you today is i'm going to show you cranberry goat cheese crostinis so they're very simple very easy and they don't take a lot of time like chef said you want your holidays to yourself you want something you can just make ahead of time and then throw in the oven so that's what this is going to be so to start you're going to need a french baguette usually an 11 ounce one is going to work a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, it's all right. And then you're gonna want about four ounces of goat cheese. So I'm just gonna demo a couple pieces just to make sure you guys can see how to do it. And then I'll show you by the magic of TV how they look once they're cooked and then we'll plate them. So to start, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna make sure you add a little fat. You can use butter or olive oil, sunflower oil, whatever you have. I like to use olive oil just because it's easy and it's quick. 
So you're just gonna put a little bit on the first side and it doesn't matter how spread out they are on the pan. That's not really gonna affect their cooking because it's bread and because it's such a thick bread, it's not gonna move and nothing's gonna stick together. Same with the cheese. The cheese is pretty stable when it's soft. It is a soft cheese on its own, so it'll be fine. So you're gonna make sure you, you don't have to brush it on. Usually I use my fingers, but just for the sake of it, I'm just gonna brush it on real quick. And then you just want it spread a little bit so your cheese isn't gonna get all crusty on the bread. You're gonna flip them over, brush on the excess from your brush. And if you have to, you can add a little bit more from your bottle. Um, this is actually from my great grandma. So this recipe is a family favorite and she does not call it what I call it, but I forgot the name. So. We're gonna call it our crostinis. Um, so once you brush on the oil, you're gonna go ahead and take your goat cheese. So I really like the flavor of goat cheese. You can replace this with mozzarella or something else, but because of the strength of the goat cheese, it really accentuates the flavor of the cranberry sauce. And it's just a really good pairing with something so sweet when it's so savory. Okay, so you're just gonna take a really nice chunk and put it onto your little crostinis and then once that's done you're gonna preheat your oven to 400 degrees and then you're gonna pop them in somewhere between 15 20 minutes and they should melt but not a lot they're gonna maintain their structure because of the type of cheese it is um but you're gonna spread it afterwards oh, thank you chef all right, so once they're done, this is what they're gonna look like. So you're gonna take your knife once they're done cooking and you're gonna spread it. So I already spread it because you wanna make sure you do it when they're still warm. So what's that? what that's gonna do is make sure that they spread a lot better because it's it gets hard. As you can see, it doesn't really leave a lot of, you know, marks when you touch it once it's kind of solidified a little bit. All right. And then also with goat cheese, there is a trick to cutting it. So it's such a soft cheese when you first get it, you can either freeze it and then cut it. Or what I like to do, chef taught me during class, <laughs> is you get really hot water, almost boiling hot. And then you take a rag, you dip the rag into the water, and then you run it over your knife this way, just so you don't cut yourself. And make sure that you can see the steam coming off your knife. That's gonna make sure you get a nice even cut as you go through that goat cheese. All right, and then let's see. Once it's done cooking, pull it out, spread it, and then you're gonna take some of the cranberry sauce. So today we're using Chef Alden, so I'm really excited. And you're just gonna take a nice little dollop. I'd say somewhere between two teaspoons and a tablespoon, depending on the size of your pieces. I like to make sure that they are a half inch thick but it's really up to you. This loaf was very small pieces, not as far as like width and mass, but just in length. Mm -hmm. So you're just gonna slowly go over them, put your cranberry sauce on. Can I give yes. you a trick about bread? <laughs> if you get a baguette from the store and it's really thin and you want larger pieces, you can always cut it on a diagonal. If you cut mm -hmm. it diagonally, it'll give you more um, real estate on which to build your crostinis, uh, even though it's a little bit thinner. We have worked many years in catering and we would do that all the time with our thin baguettes that would come in. <laughs> so just cut it on bias. <laughs> this is why she's the chef. <laughs> How's that one going? Good, it's almost done. It's looking good. This one came out really nice and it's really thick and I kind of really like the consistency compared to what I've done in the past and mm -hmm. what we serve usually just because it runs a lot. So I really like this. Yeah, it's stout. Yes, very. <laughs> it does spread really well too. Yes. Another thing for this is a bread that might go well with it. I want to say 
There's an everything bread that you can mm-hmm. usually get at any grocery store, and it's absolutely delicious with goat cheese. Yeah. Just because there's so many different flavor components that are kind of hidden in the bread itself. Yep. So that's what my family does if my great grandma likes to change it up that year or something comes up and someone else has to make it. <laughs> uh, also, this would be really, this cranberry sauce would be wonderful with a brie. Ooh, you do like yes. a baked brie and then put this on top of that baked brie and serve it with crackers. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. I love a good baked brie. Yes. Any of those fresh rind cheeses are really good like that. Cool. Yep. And my cranberry sauce over here is done. Oh, yeah. So just while Faith has been talking, this cranberry sauce is thickened up. I just added the vinegar to it to give it that nice pop. And as you can see, it's now cooked down into a sauce. Oh, yummy. Yeah, I'll eat this with a spoon. So it's that good. <laughs> Just eat it with a spoon. <laughs> All right. Great. Perfect. So right, ahead, with these, I don't like to exclude the end pieces. They're really hard to work with just because they're t- like they turn easy. But those are usually my taste testing pieces before I put it out because you have to taste everything you make. <laughs> um, and then as far as this goes, for serving, I'm just going to keep it simple and we're just going to do a couple, but I chose this time. Usually we'll serve it with something a little different. Usually it just goes as is, or sometimes you just sprinkle a little bit of finishing salt on it. But today we did some candied orange zest. So I did a quick candy, which is really easy to do at home. What you do is you, you use real sugar, granulated sugar, not powdered sugar, because those are completely different. And you're just going to blend it up a little bit. So it should have a really like soft, nice consistency. It should be really similar to powdered sugar, but it's going to be about a step above it. So just a little bit bigger. And then you're going to toss it in a bowl with your zest. And then what I like to do just to make sure it doesn't clump too much. So this is a little bit more spread out than it would be, is I either toss it in a separate bowl and then transfer it or I will make the zest really big. I'll take bigger chunks and then you'll get a wire rack, put that on a sheet tray and you'll let it candy there because then all of that liquid and all of that extra sugar is going to fall off and not be touching it and it'll keep it from clumping. And then I'm just going to take a couple of the smaller ones. And when I serve things, I do like to honor my white space. So chef likes to talk about that a lot during class <laughs> when we present our projects. I do. Um, honoring the white space just means that you can really see your plate. So being able to see what you are showing your product on is really important because you go ahead and you choose what you're going to be plating on. It's really, really important just to honor your choices and everything you do. It's all important. So with this, I just like to put a little dollop on top um, just to give it a little flavor punch. And then if you'd like, you can honestly sprinkle it beforehand, but this is just to give it that color that you really want to see. And then with plating, you want to make sure your edges are clean <laughs> and everything's straight on there. If Obviously, I chose to angle all my pieces of bread. So you want to make sure they're all on the same angle. And yeah. you want me to take it for you? Yes, so we're gonna put that right here so everyone can see how lovely that looks. And it does look like love that white space. <laughs> it's just a way of teaching students not to overcrowd the plate. That when you have to honor your white space because otherwise you can't see the food because it's all pushed together. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and the rims are for fingers, not for food. <laughs> that is a huge thing in class. Do not put dressings on your rims. <laughs> that, no. is, that is a saying that I say, like, don't put your fingers all over the rims, but the rims are for fingers, not for food, meaning do not put dusts of 
paprika or, you know, a little powdered sugar or whatever all over your rims. Because in a restaurant, if we serve that, then uh, the servers have to take that out and they can't perfectly handle that without touching the rims at least a little bit. So then you end up with fingerprints on your beautifully dressed rims instead of a beautifully dressed rim. Yes. It just ends up looking dirty and unsanitary. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you so much, Faith. Those are beautiful. And I will say with all confidence, I had to taste test these earlier this week and they are delicious. So I can say with full confidence that they are, this is something that people would love on your table. I particularly love the orange zest because the orange zest makes everything else on there kind of come together. And that's a lot of fun to eat that and you get that orange. And the orange is really nice because it makes the color pop because that little bit of orange draws your eye to there and then you see the red and then you see the bread. And I didn't mean to rhyme there, but I did anyway. And so it's a really good combination. So very well done. All right, Thank let's take you. a look at our Gwenny Sue's and then we'll talk about cider. I a, love question, a question came in about the Gwenny Sue's now that we're back there. Um, yeah. Are there other cheeses that you could use instead of Velveeta? So you could use other cheeses instead of Velveeta. The reason Velveeta works so well is because it's once you melt it, it's like a pre-made cheese sauce, but you could get a cheese sauce and use it, or you could make a cheese sauce from scratch, um, like a Welsh rarebit type of cheese sauce. Uh, just be aware if you do that, that it has to be kind of tight. Um, so you make a thicker cheese sauce. Uh, so you could use other cheeses. If you don't melt it down with some sort of milk, or um, like grit, like gravy base. Like if you're making like a broccoli cheddar soup, you have to make like milk with a roux and everything. If you don't do that, then um, it's not gonna hold together the way that these do. So that's why the Velveeta is nice is because it's like a ready-made little cheese sauce once it's melted. Um, so here, we're just gonna put these on the plate. They're so easy to do. And, and they're very hot. So my fingers are reminding me. I have oven hands though. It's kind of a joke. Like other people are like, ow. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's all right. We're good. Uh, I like to say, oh, it's not hot enough to leave a blister. It's all right. There we go. So we have our Gwenny Sue's here and they are delicious. And the cool thing about using these products is trust me, most people won't even notice the difference but you'll have something that your vegetarians can enjoy as well and um those of us who can't eat mammal really like it too because we're like what that's so exciting so much flavor so those are our lovely gwenny sues take a look at those for a second yeah all right and then we're going to talk about grog so I have some family friends who come over on a regular basis. So I, I do a thing called soup Sundays at my house a lot where I make a big old pot of soup and invite people over and we eat it and have community. It's great. Um, and uh, my friends brought over this apple cider and they called it grog. And I'm like, grog, that's like such a fun name. And it is a spiced apple cider, but it was a little different than I'd had before. And so I really wanted to talk, show you all this because it's really good. And um, it's phenomenal with whiskey, which I totally have here to add to my finished product. So the first thing you're going to do is just get a pot and you can do this in a crock pot too, which is really nice, especially if you're going to like a community meal or something to do this ahead of time, have the stuff and then just take it in a crock pot. Just make sure your crock pot's nice and sealed. So it doesn't slush around on the way there. Um, so I have three, it's a three to one ratio of, um, apple cider to cranberry juice and you want to try to find as close to actual cran like one not cranberry juice cocktail cranberry juice i actually had to search for this this is mostly cranberry juice <laughs> i read the ingredients there's some sugar and apple juice in there too but it's really close um and so what that means three to one is i have three quarts of apple cider and i have one quart of cranberry juice three to one so i just put this in my pot And it depends, whatever kind of apple cider you like, this is just a pretty straightforward apple cider. I put my cranberry juice in there and the cranberry juice is really nice. But I have some other things too. I have some ginger. 
and I just sliced the ginger. And I have cinnamon sticks. And they look nice. They just look cool. And I have nutmeg as well. And so I'm going to put the cinnamon sticks right in the pot. My ginger right in the pot and a little, not all this nutmeg. Goodness, not all this nutmeg. Okay. And then uh, the ginger. Now, one thing about ginger that I wanted to talk about is um, a lot of times people struggle with peeling ginger. And in the restaurants, we peel ginger all the time really quickly. And the way we do it is we actually take a teaspoon, just a regular tablespoon that's on your table, and you flip it over so that the rounded side is facing towards your ginger. And you just pull that edge across your ginger and it will peel it super fast every time. Don't pull your peeler out or any other fancy thing. There is no fanciness. You just literally take a teaspoon, it scrapes it right off. It's really fast. And another thing is people try to peel it with all the little nubs on the ginger root. I always break all those off and make nice cylindrical pieces and then just peel those little nubs on their own. And that makes it way easier. Um, also, if you like ginger and you use it a lot, buy a ton of ginger, peel it, put it in your food process or your blender with just, a, just like a pinch of salt and blend it up and then put it in your freezer in a little layer and then just break the layer up after it's frozen and then have it in your freezer all the time. And then you just take your minced ginger out of the freezer in the little pieces and throw it in whatever recipe you want. And then you don't have to worry about it. You can do the same thing with garlic, works awesome. And then you don't have to um, constantly be peeling and cutting up your ginger and garlic because they're always on hand. I learned that from a woman from India who taught me some fundamentals in Indian cooking in her region. And it was pretty awesome and mind blowing. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's such a good idea. <laughs> um, she did it with like a lot more salt and then that way it didn't freeze and she could just scoop it out. And I was like, oh, so smart. Uh, so I have ginger slices. I'm gonna put them right in here. I like to make the ginger slices larger for something like this because that way you can see them and you don't have the little particulates of ginger floating around. You're gonna have some of your nutmeg in there, but you won't have your ginger in there. And then this heats, that's why it's great for a crock pot. You just let it sit and you let it cook for a while and let it steep in all those yummy flavors. And then the magic of TV, chef steps off and steps back on with a, a finished product. It's steamy and everything. <laughs> All right, safety first, I gotta turn that heat off. Yes. Okay, so I've got some grog that's been sitting on the heat low and slow for a couple hours now. It's gonna have a little bit of those particulates in there, which is fine, but I just chose this glass to show you what it looks like and how you can dress it up. You can do it two ways. If you throw it in a crock pot, say for a party, whoop, you can um, put the garnishes right on the top. It looks really nice. I've got some orange slices and some cranberry. This is really hot. So just be aware. I got to put it down now. My fingers are like, ha ha ha. <laughs> All right. So we've got this. Okay. And then I'm going to just put a few cranberries in there because it looks cool. And we can put a nice orange slice. You could also do this, like I said, you can just throw the orange slices on top if it's a crock pot, or you can put it right here on the side. It looks really nice. And then if you want to keep it, it's nice to keep it separate because this is everybody friendly. But if you take, you know, I got a little maker's mark here. We're gonna take this little maker's mark and just put in about an ounce, maybe three quarters of an ounce. And now it's, an adult grog <laughs> and whiskey is the traditional alcohol to put in grog if you're going to do it i did a little research after i uh someone showed me this dish and it, i was like oh yeah okay usually this has whiskey in it okay and you make the family friendly version over here and then you have the whiskey off to the side so people can add their whiskey to it and then you have a really nice little spiked hot drink on a cold night for a holiday party and that's really fun do we have any kylie do we have any questions or anything to round out the night Yep, we had a couple come in. Um, could the nutmeg get strained out when the grog is being put in the glass? Yeah, if you wanted to strain it, you'd have to use a fine mesh strainer. Or um, if you just put in, um, 
you could like, I, I know not everybody has this, but I have a little um, cheesecloth at my house and you could just run that through the cheesecloth before you serve it. Cause it just needs to steep in there, the nutmeg. And if you have a cheesecloth and you just run the grog through cheesecloth and then into whatever you're going to hold it in after it's been cooking, then that way it'll still have the nutmeg flavor without the nutmeg particulates in there. It's a good question. Great. Okay. Kurt, Kurt says, all the dishes you've prepared look fantastic, but who's going to take care of cleaning all the pots and pans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Faith and I are going to do that after the camera <laughs> shuts off. That's good. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> He's our friend. <laughs> any yeah, other questions? That's, that's, that's it for now. If there are any last minute questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A quickly. Otherwise, we can wrap it up a bit early, but all this looks sure. fantastic and now I'm starving <laughs> and, and thirsty. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> this is and my you, end of the night. You know, yeah, exactly. Celebrate, after, celebratory after all the, yeah. After all the pots and pans are done. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Um, all right. Well, um, anything else you would like to mention before we close out? Um, I would just say, uh, Look forward, uh, look for like some future things with hospitality leadership program. We're doing some really neat stuff with our marketing. Make sure to follow uh, the Jacob Eddy uh, complex because a lot of our, even though we're in, housed in the Northern Center now, we're part of the TOS program, the Technical Occupational Sciences uh, College here at Northern. And so we have some really cool posts. One of our students named Orion just did a post on it. It was really great and informative about our program. So make sure to follow the Jacob Eddy Center um, at Northern on both Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and that will, that will keep you up to date with all the different things that we're going to be doing with our program. Um, we're going to be doing not just our events next semester, but we're, this program is only growing and doing fun, exciting things. And we want you along for that ride because you're going to love it. You're going to love it. Great. Thank you so much, chefs. Thank you for joining us, everybody out there. Um, we look forward to continuing this series in January with President Testman. You can register for that now on the alumni website. And hope you stay connected throughout 2024 by attending any new various events, whether that be online or in person. Um, also, follow us on social media uh, for things going on um, on the alumni side. And we will be sending out an email tomorrow with the recording in case you want to share with any friends with the recipes um, and also a little survey to give um, to get some feedback from you on this session and any future sessions you might want to see and also we're going to choose one winner from tonight's attendees to, to win a new alumni t-shirt so keep an eye on that too um, we hope to see you again soon thank you everybody and happy holidays